I wasn't born to be a referee. I was born to be a player. Mm. I want to be the guy making that shot at the last minute, not the referee saying, yeah, or the, the, the official in football putting his hands up and saying, yeah, the field goal went in. I want to be the guy kicking the field goal. One Path is a long, winding, unpaved, back-breaking, bumpy, miserable road to a place called success. The other road is straight, paved, smooth, comfortable, and that road ends up in a place called failure. Welcome to the show. I am Kyle Matthews on the Matthews Mentality Podcast, where we dive into the mindset of the world's most driven founders, CEOs, business moguls, athletes, and entrepreneurs. Each episode will turn our guest wisdom into practical advice that will help you build a deeper understanding of what led them to success and the mentality behind what got them there. Let's get started. Welcome to the Matthews Mentality Podcast. Today, we are joined by Alan Dershowitz, a Brooklyn native who has been called the nation's most peripatetic. Did I say that right? You did. That's a great civil liberties lawyer, the most distinguished defenders of individual rights, the best known criminal lawyer in the world, the top lawyer of last resort and America's most public Jewish defender. While he is known for defending clients such as Anatoly Sharansky, Klaus Van Bloh, O.J. Simpson, Michael Milken, Mike Tyson, and Donald Trump. He continues to represent numerous indignant defendants and takes half of his cases pro bono. He is a very, very, very vocal defender of civil liberties and the Constitution through his media appearances and is the Felix Frankfurter professor at Harvard Law School. He is the author of 52 works of fiction and nonfiction. That number changes like almost every day. 52 fiction and nonfiction, including seven bestsellers. Alan, I can't thank you enough for being here with me. What a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to this wonderful city. No, I really I, enjoy I, it. How, how's, how's Nashville treating you? Oh, unbelievable. The music, I've only been here 24 hours and I've heard three uh performances. It's been great. And we were talking, you're going to be here for another day or two. You got yeah. some, you got some more concerts lined oh, up. Yeah. 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 That's exciting. And you're here, you got your wife and daughter, right? Right. And they're the, they're the ones who brought yeah. me here because they're, they both love uh, country music. I like it, but I'm getting to love it now, having been exposed to it more. Yeah. I like when I moved from LA, I, I definitely liked it, but I was not given a choice. Once I moved here, I had to learn to love it, like of course. which I do. It's a fantastic music genre. Um, you, you, you've, we're going to do the best we can to cover in a short period of time. Uh, you, everything you've accomplished such so much, you've accomplished such an interesting life. So I always like to start with this question. I don't even know if you can answer is like, what does a typical day or week look like for you? Is there even a typical day? There is no typical day. Every day is completely different. I wake up, uh, in the morning, usually around seven o'clock or so. And I look at my emails and I say, oh, my God, this is what I have to do today. I get calls from death row. I get people around the world wanting me to represent them. I'll get calls from the White House or calls from Congress, uh, calls from various student groups. So every every day is completely unpredictable. How do you know or how do you decide on <laughs> what calls to take? Sometimes the White House, you might not take the call, but... Uh... How do you, how do you, you, you get so much inbound. I don't even just call it business, just so much inbound communication. How do you prioritize something like that? When I was teaching at Harvard, I always had a staff of two or three research assistants and they would often vet the calls or the letters. And I had one rule. Don't tell me whether it's a paying case or a pro bono case. I want to make the decision first to take the case or not to take it. Then you can tell me. Now I'm on my own. I don't have a research assistant. I don't have a full-time secretary. So basically I make, I make decisions. They have to, uh, at my age, I want to make sure the case really interests me. Because when I take a case, I don't, I don't take that many cases. When I take a case, it really is a relationship. Yeah. And I have to love something about it. I could hate the client. I can hate what he did. I can hate almost everything else about it. But if the issue is an important one that I think affects the lives of American civil liberties, I'm going to take the and, case. And that's where your people call it your passion or your enthusiasm. That's where your love in the law lies today is protecting civil liberties and ultimately the constitution. Yes. And particularly recently, um, my love and support for, for Israel has been tested a lot sure. by what's going on there. And so I take cases uh, involving Israel and 
and some Jewish causes well, as well. That was one of the things. While again, there there may be no typical day. I was going to ask where where do you find yourself spending most of your time today, like from a topic or um, you know a work perspective. Well, I try to create balance. I try to walk five miles a day. Um, it's a lot to stay in shape. And um, I try to live well, love good food, love a nice glass of Brunello before dinner. Or a hot chicken sandwich. Oh, my God, was that good. That was good. I had no idea. I would never have picked a a fried chicken sandwich with pickles until you told me how good it was. Boy, were you you right. Just don't have one every day. You'll be all right. But uh, all right, so you walk a lot. Again, balance in terms of like, you know, keeping uh, healthy and, and active. But what about... As it relates to work, are there some specific projects today that you can talk about? I know not everyone you can talk about that that is keeping you uh, extra busy. Well, Israel is keeping yeah. me extra busy right now. Um, but uh, civil liberties, the First Amendment, I care deeply about that. The other part of my day that I try to do every day is music. I love opera. I love classical music. But I love every kind of music. And I, a day for me without music is not a complete day. Got it. And so in in speaking to, and this applies to music, but civil liberties, Israel, uh, I'm going to take this conversation kind of back to the beginning of, and, and really l- ha- helping the audience learn a bit, a little bit about your childhood. And perhaps mm-hmm. some of those threads were present from early yeah. on. What was, uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Brooklyn. I was born in the Williamsburg section of Brooklyn, moved to Borough Park, um, and spent my youth there. I even stayed home when I went to college. I didn't have a college dormitory experience. I was the first person in my family to go to college. No, let me make a, a, an exception to that. My mother, who was a brilliant high school student in Williamsburg, in, was the first member of her family to enroll in New York City College in September of 1929. Come October 1929, yeah. the depression, she had to quit the world to make changed. $13 a week to help her family. So right. I was the first person really to go to college. But I grew up in, in Brooklyn, and I'm very much a, a Brooklyn guy. Brooklyn guy. And so two parents, brothers, sisters? One brother, a little younger than I am, was also a lawyer. And my father worked so, so hard. He was uh, at a little shop, a little wholesale store selling men's work clothing and men's underwear and army and navy stuff after the war. And my mother was uh, always a bookkeeper. Funny story. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm having, this is a name dropping story. It was the 50th anniversary of me being a law clerk on the Supreme Court. And the justices invited us to lunch. And uh, who sits next to me? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And we start uh, uh, talking. And she says, Alan, I have a riddle for you. What's the difference between a woman who worked as a bookkeeper in the garment district in New York and a Supreme Court justice. And I said, what? She said, one generation. That's right. So I said, I have one for you. What's the difference between a woman who worked in the garment district of New York as a bookkeeper and a Harvard professor? And she said, your mother worked in the garment yeah. district? And we found out our mothers worked in the same building, oh, not the wild. same person. That's very but cool. But they were exactly the same age, same generation, and they both had, that's a, you know. That's a special bond right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she was a special lady. She accomplished a lot, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, so normally later in the conversation, we, we, t- we kind of get into the professional arc, but I'm going to fast forward a second and just you are known as a very, very hard worker. Like yeah. You just stay busy. And yeah. again, if you're not walking and, or with your family, you're working. When I am walking, I'm on the phone. That, you know, Okay, right. fair play. You know, yes, you you even then you're you're working. Uh, do you, in your opinion, do you think uh, you you had touched on? I know we had spoken earlier. Your, your dad was just, he just he was a grinder. Like he yeah. worked. Yeah. Was that was? Do you think you get that from from him in the sense like you just saw it, or was that something that was discussed in your household growing up? Never discussed it, but I just saw it. Um, for like me, an expectation it was an expectation. Got you it. work hard and. Um, and uh, you never take anything for granted. Look, my parents came from, um, <clears throat> my grandparents from a, a small shtetl in, in Europe where Jews couldn't work hard, mm-hmm. where they were precluded from working. And, you know, coming to America was the greatest thing that ever happened to my family. My grandmother loved America. July 4th, she would take me to the Statue of Liberty and make me sing 
both verses of the national anthem, not just the first one that everybody knows, yeah. and she would salute the flag. And we loved America. And one of the goals of America is you work hard, you work very hard, and the American dream. Do you still believe that's uh, the I case? Do. I think it's changed now. Um, it's changed now with the death of meritocracy and the substitution of identity politics for meritocracy. Today, more is determined not by the level of your hard work, but by what your background is, who you are, what your ethnicity is. It was a little bit that way when I was growing up, the opposite way. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, if you were a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you had advantages. Jews weren't hired by various firms. When I finished law school, first in my class at Yale Law School, I was turned down by 42 out of 42 Wall Street firms. They just weren't hiring Jews in those days. By the time my son graduated law school 25 years later, everybody wanted him. Yeah, so we yeah, I'd say we 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 made progress, but again, longer conversation, uh, but maybe it's flipping. Yeah. But you you hit on a word that's very important to this the show, myself, anyone I talk to, meritocracy. Yeah. And it's a so, dirty word. <laughs> you, you, you could get you could get canceled by using the word meritocracy. All right, so hopefully, please don't cancel Ellen and I for saying meritocracy. We'll say it a lot today. I'm going to say it one more time right now. Meritocracy in that, uh, I mean, you know, you you worked very hard as a kid, and and you were very motivated. It seems like from a very early age. Is that safe to say? It's safe to say, but I was a very very bad student uh, up until college. It was dramatic change. Um, I went to yeshiva, Jewish mm -hmm. parochial school, and boy, was it parochial. Uh, and, um, you know, I, the rabbis hated me. I didn't like them. Why do you think that is? Was because it, I was always questioning. You're, you're a rebel. I was always questioning. Uh, you know, there's a prayer in Judaism you say every day, Baruch Ata Adonai, means blessed is the Lord. Baruch Ata Adonai, Adonai means God. I changed the prayer to Baruch Ata, I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, and I was I'm a sure, skeptic. I'm sure the rabbis I was a loved, skeptic, they and it. they didn't like it. And so I graduated high school. Let me try to remember. I think I was 39th out of a class of 47. So there were eight dumber kids than me, but 39 or 38 smarter kids than me. So I had trouble getting into college. And fortunately, there was a test you could take to get into Brooklyn College. And I was always a very good, good test tester, taker. Yeah. So. I got into Brooklyn College by the skin of my teeth and then finished the top of my class I, there, too. I know. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say this because I know my wife will make sure my kids listen to this. But it's it sounds like me. I was uh, I was a knucklehead in school, uh, up at, really up until college. And, uh, you know, in a, in a different sense, always uh, questioning things. Yeah. And uh, but but I was decent at tests and that was my saving grace. But uh, it's um, we. Was it just like a, a light went off one day where you, you went from, you know, testing authority, let's put it, and you just locked in to become ultimately in, in, in law school the number one student at Yale? Like, well, how, how did that transformation take that's place? That's a positive way of putting it. For me, it was a little different. I wanted to show the, the guys. I got you. I wanted to show them that they were wrong. I really was determined to prove that I was smarter than they thought I was. Look— Everybody in elementary school and high school knew I was smart. I was a wise guy. I told good jokes. I was fairly popular. I was a good athlete. I just wasn't good in class because I didn't pay attention. Um, my wife, who's a PhD in psychology, said I had attention deficit disorder. I was going to say, nowadays they uh, would diagnose that. And they would have given me pills, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. which would have been terrible. Not, not good but, for you. But um, once I got into college, I just loved every minute of college. I loved all my professors, and um, I had role models that I could follow, and uh, it, it changed everything. So this is Brooklyn College. Yeah. Be before we get into college, I just want to you know cl close a book on your childhood. How would you describe your childhood? Uh, you know, kind of generalizing. Was it idyllic? Was it challenging? Were there any specific hardships you felt like you had to overcome? We were not poor. That is, I never got, went to bed hungry. But we never had anything extra. We couldn't. Mm -hmm. I had to. I had to babysit to earn the money to go to the movies, um, and I had to babysit to get a ticket to Ebbets Field, which was sixty-five cents. Uh, so we weren't poor, but we were. I would say working class. And um, uh, I didn't think of myself as in any way deprived. Uh, so I would say I had a good. I had a 
good childhood. My parents didn't have a good childhood for me because they were, you know, they're Jewish parents. They want their kids to succeed. Mm -hmm. and I didn't succeed. I was a failure in elementary school and high school. When I went to my prom, um, this was an Orthodox school, so everything had to be done according to routine. There was a committee of girls that would check who you could go to the prom with. And there's this girl in the neighborhood named Karen, blonde and beautiful. And I, I, I lusted after her, not in that sense, yeah, I just that. I wanted yeah. to go to the prom mm -hmm. with her. And I said, I want to go with Karen. And the committee laughed at me and they said, you can't go with Karen. Karen's on the A list. You're on the C list. Pick somebody from the C list. And so oh, I went with my cousin. Fair enough. Well, hopefully you had a good time. I did. Um, so you get into Brooklyn College. It sounds like you had a phenomenal experience I did. there. I was president of the student body. I was captain of the debating team. We won the athletic championship. Basketball is your sport, right? Basketball, but I played soccer also. Got it. Okay. And um, it was just a phenomenal experience at college. What, and was this around the time that, you, you know, kind of the light went off for you in terms of achievement and becoming a top student to, if, to show those high school teachers who thought you might? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, well, I, what was the, one of the quotes I, I read in the preparation? It said, uh, I think a teacher told you to find something that required a big mouth and no brain or something. That's right. Like, yeah. yeah. So uh, he you became said, a lawyer. Yeah. Become a lawyer. Well, yeah, yeah. I think, I think yeah. you need more than just a big and mouth. One but. of my teachers said to me when I did it, when I got like a 99 on the history regents, the teacher said, don't let it get to your head. You're a 75 student. You'll always be a 75 student. I'm not going to ask who, but you could probably tell me her name of off the tip of your his tongue. His name, Mr. Lilker. Yeah, his, his yeah. name. Uh, all right, so you're you're at Brooklyn College. Do you go straight from there to Yale, or is there I do. some no, work? No, straight from there, although the president of Brooklyn College would not recommend me. Why not? Even though I was a top student, because I was a big supporter of the NAACP, the National Association of Advancement of Colored People. I conducted marches, went to Washington. And uh, he thought that was a kind of communist front organization. He was very conservative, so he wouldn't recommend me. But I got into all the law schools I applied to. And what year would, was this in? Uh, 59. 1959. And I went to Yale Law School from 59 to 62 and had a great, great time there. When you, when you got into Brooklyn College, did, did you know you wanted to be a lawyer at the time? Or was that something that happened over the course of those four years? I think I was a lawyer by default. I wasn't good at anything else. And everybody always said, you know, you should be a lawyer. So uh, I didn't take pre-law. I took a lot of philosophy and history, um, but nothing pre-law because I figured I have enough time to learn about law in law school. And that was a smart move. And how was, uh, how was the Yale experience? Oh, phenomenal. I was editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal, first in my class. Couldn't have been better, made lifelong friends. And, uh, you know, the most amazing thing is between 1955, when I was almost last in my class, and 1962, when I was already offered a job at Harvard Law School, it, it's only five years. It's like the Red Sox from the worst to the first. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, it's, it's, it's quite the transformation in a yeah. short period of time. Uh, let me, <clears throat> editor-in-chief of uh, the, the Law Journal, uh, top student in your class, what, in your opinion, allowed you to achieve those things? I think um, that I never, never accepted anybody else's views of anything. I was, uh, I was an arrogant brat. Um, I remember talking back to my teachers. And, of course, in yeshiva, if I could talk back to my teachers, I'd get slapped. At Yale, I'd get commended. Oh, my God, he's talking back to his teachers. And, and, and uh, I was always questioning, always trying to be creative. And that worked very well at Yale Law School. And in, in questioning and creative and challenging um, what you're being told, would you would you say it's also it's fair to say that a lot of hard work and discipline as well during that time? Always. But it was the, the questioning attitude. The questioning attitude was always a double-edged sword. It got me noticed, but it also made enemies. And the same thing, it continued through my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still question everything. And because I question both sides of everything, I'm not part of any team. I'm, both, not, both sides loyal, I'm not a loyal Scotsman, as I think yeah. they used to say. Um, everybody should be questioned. In, in, in the process of, you know, questioning and working very hard to achieve a 
at the time where you were at Yale, I mean, liter the literal top, right? Yeah. What, a lot, there's a lot of people, not a lot of people, but people will go to college or they'll go to law school. Maybe they'll even end up going to law school at Yale, but only one person a year achieves yeah. the number one spot. Um, were there ever times where in person, not that you were pursuing that as the goal, but you're obviously pursuing excellence. Were there ever times that you, you've just found yourself working really hard or staying up late studying or just doing a lot where you question like, why am I doing all this? Why am I working so hard? Like, is it going to be all worth it? No, it's so interesting. I question everybody else, but I rarely question myself. Uh, I never thought that way. I just, that was the way you do it. You work hard and hopefully you succeed. One of my professors, Alex Bickle, who was a great professor and a great mentor, said to me, Alan, you know, on your trajectory, you'll be on the United States Supreme Court. And I disappointed him greatly. And I said, that's not my goal. That's not my goal. My mother would be very happy if I were a justice of the Supreme Court. But I wasn't born to be a referee. I was born to be a player. Mm. I want to be the guy making that shot at the last minute, not the referee saying, you know, yeah, or the, the, the official in football putting his hands up and saying, yeah, the field goal went in. I want to be the guy kicking the field goal. Interesting. Yeah, because I was going to say, well, what was the goal? But it's, yeah, I mean, I love the analogy of being a player on the field, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, a Supreme Court justice, again, incredibly prestigious, but, in, you know, interpreting the law, so to speak. I would not have enjoyed it. I would have, you know, thrived with the, with the note, you know, the fame, and my mother would have loved it. And it wouldn't have made me wake up every day the you, way I do now. I don't, I don't think you would have enjoyed, you know, they, they have to be, uh, let's call it very soft spoken, right? They can't mm -hmm. say certain things. You know, I think you, uh, you like to, to share your opinions on things. And so, um, you, you, you're at Yale, you do great. You're coming out of college. What happens? I didn't have a plan. I never was a strategist for my own a career. I never said, this is what I want to do in the next two years, five years, seven years. Um, I, I took advantage of opportunities. I tried to understand what was going on in the world around me. I loved Oliver Wendell Holmes' advice to his young law clerk. He said, you must live the passion of your times. And that's what I've tried to do, live the passion of my times. And as the times change, my passions change. Got it. And, and, in 19, I think it was 1962, so more or less right out of school, you went, as many do, but you went and uh, clerked, right? Yes, I and, clerked and, the two great justices. And, and, and so judges. one of them specifically, I think it was uh, David Bazelon. Right. He was very important in your life, correct? Very important. Uh, he taught me a number of things. Num number one, that I could be a, a, a Jew, a liberal, an intellectual, and that I don't have to pick one career. He was a judge, and I think he was a little restless as a judge. Uh, he said, don't follow into anybody else's footsteps. Your, your, your feet are too big to fit into anybody else's footsteps. Create your own life and your own career. And I tried very hard to do that. I was the first professor at Harvard really to have an active civil liberties practice while I was teaching. And I think the reason for my success as a teacher was I brought the practice into the classroom. And at the same time, I brought the classroom into my practice. So it made me a better practicing lawyer and a better teacher. And that was not something that was done. In fact, I was criticized uh, for it. But because most of my cases, particularly early in my career, were pro bono, I didn't make any money on them. The criticism was hard to level. And mm. so People at Harvard accepted me, and I was writing my scholarship by writing article after article, so nobody could really complain. But I had really several full-time jobs. I was a full-time professor. I was not quite a full-time litigator, but a very substantial litigator, a full-time writer of books and, and articles, and a kind of public intellectual going on television and writing for the New York Times. So I had four careers, and I never wanted to choose among them. I wanted to do them all. You wanted to do them all. And the only limitation is 24 hours in a day. There are 24 hours in the day. I, I never realized some, that. Somebody, somebody told some, me that once. Somebody told me that. Now, be, be, before we get into the meat of your career and... Um, By the way, yeah. I have a, a friend who once billed 27 hours in a day. He was traveling. I was going to uh, say, did Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. And he billed 27 hours uh, and, and they framed it in his law firm. Good man. I hope you're sure it helped him make partner. Yeah. But... Um, 
Bazelon, yeah, I think you once described him as your best and worst boss. Uh, oh, he was a terrible boss he, for somebody he other you than to the me. Bone. Yeah. yeah, but but that was that was great for you. For but me, it was fantastic. I couldn't wait to come into work, and I knew I would be working late at night, and I knew I'd be doing very difficult things. But I loved it. My co clerk couldn't bear it. And how old were you at the time, roughly? Twenty one. Twenty one. Yeah. So. Um, what advice would you have or perspective, you know, as we get older, hopefully we have more perspective for a lot of uh, 21, 22, 23 year olds coming out of college today. And a lot of them, whatever professional field, whether it was law, real estate, anything in between that they want to achieve in their minds, they think I, I want to get to the top. I want to be the number one, yeah. like, like yeah. you were at Yale. Uh, but generally speaking, what I've found, and you could correct me if I'm wrong, it takes tremendous sacrifice and discipline and, and, long hours and working a lot. And, um, it's not sacrifice if you love it. That's a great point. That's a great point. I was going to say when, when in your first clerkship, he'd have you work until 2 AM or he'd be yeah. really hard on you. Yeah. And again, he wasn't worried about your feelings. No. Like he was just, he was worried about you doing the best job you could. Um, what perspective would you have to offer up to, you know, your kind of typical 20 year old who thinks they, what they've chosen, they want to be great at it, but they need to prepare for the, for the, the amount of effort that re is required to, to achieve greatness. Well, I would say, first of all, have a plan, but be willing to deviate from the plan. As things change, you have to change. You have to adapt to changing reality. You can't allow your pre-existing plan to f deny you opportunities that you never anticipated would happen. So be very, very flexible about your career path. After Bazelon, there was, um, was it Supreme, uh, Arthur Goldberg? Arthur Goldberg, yeah. Justice Arthur Goldberg. He was also a great mentor. Um, I, I, he was not a role model for me as much as Bazelon was, but, um, you know, he was also very smart and very demanding and appreciated me very much and invited me to all the meetings with the other justices. So, um, I had a great experience as a law clerk. And when you come out of, let's we'll call it clerkship, what ha what comes I next? I go right away to Harvard. I was offered a job in the Justice Department by Bobby Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General. And uh, and I turned it down because I had the teaching offer from Harvard. I wanted to be a professor. And for those who don't know, and, and again, I, I want to make sure I'm, you were the... You started at Harvard Law at 25? At 25, yeah. Was pretty I young. was the youngest in the, in the history. That's what I was going to say. And three years younger, or three years later, excuse me, was the youngest tenured professor yeah. in their history. And many of my students were older than me. Remember, a lot of kids go to law school after yeah. taking a few years off and working in the real estate industry mm -hmm. or commercial, whatever. Uh, so I had students older than me. And how'd, yeah. they, how'd they take that? Was well, it, they were fine. I was terrified. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they, they were fine. But, you know, a little bit of arrogance probably goes a long way. And if you're in a position like that, and I was a, a I devoted a lot of time to my teaching. I mm -hmm. thought through every single class and I would have notes for my classes. And then at the end of the semester, I'd tear up the notes. I didn't want to teach the same class again. And I would teach it differently the next year. And then in 50 years at Harvard, I taught 50 different classes N ranging from psychiatry in the law to literature wow. in the law. In my last semester, I actually taught baseball in the law. And uh, law. yeah, yeah, there's a lot about law in baseball. And now, so would, are all these recorded somewhere? Some are. Yeah, I'm I was sure going to say, that would be, a, yeah, that'd be yeah, a killer yeah, yeah, like yeah. law library, 50 years with Alan Dershowitz at Harvard. Mm -hmm. where, but I, they, I don't and know. And I taught they're... courses in the college as well. I Got taught it. a course called Thinking About Thinking with a Philosopher and a paleontologist. I taught courses on law and mathematics. So I, I love to learn when I was teaching. And this is when they converted you to being a Red Sox and a Celtics fan. Uh -huh. right? It was easy because I came to Boston and immediately got a call from a gruff guy. Hey, hey, Alan, it's Red Auerbach. Yeah, exactly. Want to come to a Celtics game? Yeah, I want to come to a Celtics game. I get into the locker room. No, I get to meet the players. Uh, it makes he was, sense. It he makes was my sense. guy. And then I got to know the owner of the Red Sox as well. So what you're, you're teaching at Harvard, obviously law classes and some other classes here and there. And in between that, you're litigating, you're 
Some of it was accidental. Um, I was vacationing with my family, and I get a phone call from an old friend saying, do you remember Shelly? He lived down the block from us. He's just been indicted for murder. He's facing capital punishment. He can't find a lawyer. So I go to New York, and I become his lawyer. I didn't even know how to find the courthouse. I had no experience, and it was a, you know, a potential death penalty murder case, and we won the case. And uh, that started me on my career. I was going to say, you, you, you know, you— you're known for some very big, high-profile wins, oftentimes uh, representing clients that, you know, had challenges uh, finding attorneys. What was your first um, big, big, big case where you're like, wow, the, the eyes are on this case? And it doesn't have to necessarily be someone that was controversial, but I think you... you yeah, just, well, this yeah, case, that's this, what I was this say. Jewish Defense League case... And, and he was having was, trouble finding an attorney. He couldn't find like. an attorney. People on the left didn't want to represent him. Why was that? Uh, because he was a conservative member of the Jewish Defense League, and they believed in violence. And my mother didn't want me to defend him, even though he come from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did, and it, it became a front-page story in the New York Times. So very early in my career, um, I had some uh, uh, notoriety. Then I defended um, the star of the horrible porn film called Deep Throat. Never seen the film today, even yeah. to this day, even though I defended it. Harry Reams, and that was uh, notorious as well. And then I guess the Klaus von Bülow case was the one that brought me more national attention. Before we talk about the von Bülow case, um, what what was going, what was your mindset and your mentality at the time to take these cases that a lot of your peers wouldn't take? Was it getting back to you being younger and just like question, being a skeptic, questioning everything, wanting to show them? What, what were the motivations at the time? I love challenges. I Got love it. taking cases where people say you can't possibly win. I remember New York Magazine had an article by a prominent lawyer saying, oh, Dershowitz will take the Von Bülow case. He'll do a good job, but there's no way he's going to win that case. I love that, uh, and I love that challenge, and uh, I like to prove people wrong. He's kind of like an, an underdog, right? Yeah. And I, I think you know, my it, father uh, was a strong guy, um, and he liked to box, and uh, he was the uh, second oldest member of his family of eight, and uh, the oldest was infirm. So my father was the guy who had to protect the family, and in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, uh, they were they were gangs, not, you know, like today, yeah, but uh, uh, he was out there fighting. And when I was like five years old, he bought me boxing gloves and uh, taught me how to box. And, and so you kind of had this fighter's mentality yeah, yeah. And, and also um, an underdog or, you know, protecting the underdog. Me, always defend the underdog. Always defend the You've underdog. You've got to defend the underdog. Don't ever be a bully. Always when you fight, he used the term fight up. Fight people stronger than you, punch people up. who are who are uh, more prominent than you are. Never fight people who are not up to you. Do you think that, uh, amongst, I'm sure, other motivators, but that provided the fuel to to power you through, you know, some of these more challenging oh, cases? Yeah. and I think it's been what I've done all my life. I always fight up. I always fight against people who are more powerful and, and stronger and always try to defend the underdog. Provide you almost unlimited energy to do it. You know, I've been blessed by the good Lord with energy. I'm 85 years old and I'm still walking my five miles and I'm still, you know. Going to country music concerts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you'll be down on Broadway later tonight drinking those $8 Probably. tall cans. <laughs> so, all right. So talk to us, talk to the audience about the Von Bulow case, that was the big one that kind of blew your um, celebrity up yeah. in a sense. It, so my specialty was always and. I was called the and professor, uh, law and medicine, law and science, law and mathematics, because I never believed that law itself uh, was that interesting. You always had to fill the vessel of law with information from other disciplines. And the Von Bulow case was a perfect case for that because it was a scientific case. How did she get into a coma? Was it insulin? Was it her own uh, drinking? Was it her own hypoglycemia? And I handled the case as if it was a scientific experiment. I put together a legal team of students from the medical school, from science, from the law school, and we eventually proved that the government's theory that he had injected her with insulin could not stand up to scientific analysis, and we won the case. When, when you're interviewing... Uh, oftentimes a defendant, right, um, to, to decide to take on the case. And you, 
whatever you're comfortable sharing in the sense of what cases you did or did not. But my question becomes, uh, do you have to get to a point as an attorney where you actually believe that they're innocent? Well, I'll tell you a story yeah. about that. So Mike Tyson and Don King call mm -hmm. me and say, uh, as you know, Tyson's been convicted of rape and he's going to be sentenced tomorrow or the next day. He'd like you to fly out to Indiana, meet with him before he gets sentenced because he'll probably be sent to jail uh, that same day. So I go to see him in his hotel room and there's Don King and a bunch of hanger honors and Mike Tyson. And Mike Tyson says, all right, Alan, before I decide whether to hire you to be my appeal lawyer, I want to know, do you believe I'm innocent? And I said, Mike, it would be a fool for me to believe either way. I haven't read the transcript. I've just read newspaper accounts. I have no idea whether you're innocent or not. He said, all right, all right, all right, enough of that legalism. What kind of a person do you think I am? I said, Mike, you want the truth? He said, yeah. I said, Mike, you're a schmuck. He looked at me and he said to the people around him, this guy just called me a schmuck. He says, why'd you call me a schmuck? I said, going up to a hotel room at three o'clock in the morning without any witnesses, with a woman you've never met and a woman who, you know, could conceivably have been a gold digger after you, that's a schmuck. Turns to his people and he says, he's right. I was a schmuck. Why didn't you tell me I was probably a schmuck? Was like, he's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You That's know. true. <laughs> he did have that pitch <laughs> did voice. Did I do that right, Zach? That pitch voice. You're pretty yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Hey, you know. And he what? said, you're hired. Yeah. <laughs> I was about to say, what type of person do you think I am? Um, so, uh, so <laughs> sorry, I don't think I've ever done a Mike Tyson person. <laughs> Um, he's a nice guy, by the way. I, I like him. He's yeah. turned around his life. He has a show he now seems in like Las Vegas. Doing, he seems like he's doing and great. He's doing okay. Yeah. yeah, he's he's doing great. And uh, uh, yeah, um, I mean that was obviously a very very high profile case. Um, another one that I was just having played football at SE OJ in the mid nineties. Yeah. Now uh, what happened is the 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 soonest. The death occurred. Mm -hmm. I was on the Katie Couric, NBC, whatever, in the morning. And I had just written a book called The Abuse Excuse about the Menendez brothers and people like that. And uh, so she asked me what I think. I wasn't his lawyer. I said, well, I think he did it um, because mostly it's the spouse who did it when there are cases like this. And he has a history. So I think he probably did it. And he'll probably come up with some abuse excuse for why he shouldn't be sentenced to death, which he was facing at the time. A few days later, I get a phone call from Bob Shapiro. Alan, we want you to be one of the lawyers in the case. I said, I can't. I already said I thought he did it. He said, everybody thinks he did it, mm. uh, but he's facing the death penalty, and you don't turn down death penalty cases. And I said, okay. And I took the case. They then took the death penalty off the table. But again, very scientific, the case. There were uh, uh, socks, which had the blood of both O.J. Simpson and the victim. And uh, it was a damning piece of evidence, and I was able to prove with the help of the other lawyers that the blood was actually spilled on the socks by a police officer, not gotten during a killing because of the way the blood splatter on the socks was. So, again, it was a scientific case. I remember that one. Um, fast forwarding uh, a handful of years, uh, Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, that was a— that was a big one. A key First Amendment case. It's still going on. We yeah. haven't resolved it. No, I think um, he's, he's... He's, you know, he's going to probably be tried at some point. It's been years now. And, you know, he spent some terrible time in the Ecuadorian embassy, uh, mm -hmm. virtually a prisoner. And, uh, you know, for me, he's like the New York Times, in New York Times, uh, in the Pentagon Papers case. He disclosed information um, and uh, I don't think that uh, he should be prosecuted for it, but that has, hasn't, hasn't been resolved yet. Yeah, he disclosed information about the government listening, the U.S. government listening to civilians, correct? Yeah, yeah. Like, and many of, other things. And there are things he didn't disclose because he didn't want to uh, disclose sources or methods of intelligence. How do you, well, I'm trying to frame this question the right way, as much as you're a fighter and protect the underdog and, you know, show authority, right? Yep. It, there had to have been multiple moments, correct me if I'm wrong, but multiple moments and maybe one moment that was there ever a moment where they're, where they're getting, where they're defending Tyson or Simpson or Julian Assange and, and uh, all the way to, you know, Donald Trump. And we could talk about him in a second. It's, uh, 
where the pressure was so much that it actually re- you came close to saying, you know what, the, the juice isn't worth the squeeze here. My, I'm, I can't do this. No, I never had that. Uh, what I had was real regret on taking the Jeffrey Epstein case because when I took the Jeffrey Epstein case, it seemed like a relatively minor case. There were two or three women, one of whom was 17, the others were over 18, and it didn't seem like such a big deal at the time, and he was prepared to plead guilty. And then, of course, the new information emerged by the time I was kind of locked into the case. And then I got accused by a woman I never met, never heard of, uh, who fortunately uh, has now acknowledged that she quote, may have confused me with somebody else, misidentified me, but I went through hell in that case. And so that was probably the one I most regret having taken. Having taken. And, was my, a, and, and was there a time during that that you thought maybe I should drop this and you didn't? I can't drop a case, but there were yeah. times during the case I, I said to myself, I wish I hadn't taken it. And what about, uh, what about Donald Trump? I mean, I'm sure you're getting heat for... Uh, oh, I got more, I got much, much more pushback on Donald Trump than I did on any of the other cases, including Jeffrey Epstein, particularly from my colleagues and friends and neighbors in Martha's Vineyard who stopped talking to me, wouldn't allow me to speak at the library, wouldn't allow me to speak at the community center, banned me from the synagogue. Uh, it was really McCarthyism. So they, uh, believe in, they believe in free speech up until... For thee, but not for... for yeah, thee, up but until not it's for uh, the, inconvenient. Right. Due process for me, but not for what the, was, Everybody has the right to counsel except people they don't like. Except people they don't like, yeah. What was in, in a, you know, Cliff Notes version, what was the... what? Because Donald Trump has a lot of legal issues, oh, as yeah. you know. But, but what were you working with? It was only on? one issue. Yeah. He was impeached for abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. Now, I know the Constitution. And I went back and I read every word of the debates over the Constitution, and it was clear that the framers did not intend to allow a president to be impeached on such vague terms. They wanted only treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors, and none of them were even charged by Congress. So I took that case on a purely constitutional issue, In my hour and six minute presentation in front of the Senate, I never mentioned the word Donald Trump. I said, I'm representing the Constitution, the presidency. Uh, Today it can be used against one person. Tomorrow it'll be used Mm -hmm. against another person. I made an abstract, I think, compelling constitutional argument, but boy, did I get hell for it. You got hell. What was the worst part of that was just losing relationships? No, the worst part of it was my wife. Um, she lost friends over it. Right. Um, you know, she went to work out in a gym and somebody wouldn't enter the gym. She said, oh, that's Alan Dershowitz's wife. We can't go in the same room. Yeah. People walked out. Oh, 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 Caroline Kennedy, the daughter of President Kennedy. I'd represented her uncle, uh, Ted Kennedy, at Chappaquiddick, and no problem. But she saw me at a dinner party, and she said, if I knew you had been invited, I would not have come. I said, would you have come after I represented your uncle Ted Kennedy. Uh, she didn't have anything to say about that, but uh, people just didn't want to have anything to do with me or listen to me or allow me to speak based on the fact that I represented somebody who they thought was so terrible. But your mentality, your mindset, you just, you push through it. I did. My family paid a heavy price yeah. for it. And, you know, I had some regrets about that. I did put my principles over my family and that may not be the right thing. What, um, I'm going to, there's, a, there's people out there, it could be politics, obviously, because that, that's kind of politics, right? But it could just be peer pressure. Um, a lot of our listeners, you know, we've gotten feedback. A lot of them are, you know, they're young entrepreneurs, they're starting their businesses, right. or, they're, or they're thinking about it, or, or they're in a very entrepreneurial career choice, not just real estate. Obviously, you see the real estate guys and gals out there, but they're early in their career and, and they're they're busting their ass. They're working hard. They're, they're doing the things that over a long enough period of time will put them in a position to be successful. But there is a lot of messaging socially about now with uh, work-life balance in your 20s and, you know, you, don't, you shouldn't be working that hard. And, and so they face a lot of pressure. And, and what I've seen in, in coaching a lot of young uh, men and women entering the professional world is, is it's hard enough to succeed in a career that's you know, grueling and demanding and requires a lot of work, especially early on. But then you're getting pressured from your peer group, you know, whether it's like, hey, you know, come on out with us or like, let's, you don't need to work that hard. Or in this case, something much more serious, your family is getting pressured from your community uh, to not 
uh, it, defend the law or defend the constitution? Like what advice would you have for someone who's feeling pressured from a, from a group of peers that they very much value their, their relationships with, but they they know what they're doing is, is, is they're on the right path, but it might be inconsistent with what they're hearing from a messaging standpoint. Everybody's different. Everybody has to strike a different balance between uh, work and family and uh, work and community. It's There's no one answer for all. But if your passion is your work, um, you're not going to be happy if you don't work hard and you don't make it uh, and you're not as successful as you could have been. You'll blame it later on on your family and others who kept you from it. So I, I would say... Follow your passions. I know that's a cliche, yeah. but if you really enjoy working hard and really have a goal, pursue it. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's a. It, it seems like every episode, someone says, you know, it's a cliche saying, uh, but if you find something you love to do, you'll never work a day in your life. Would you say you, you love the law? I love the law, but I've worked days in my life. It doesn't mean that every day is going to be a joy. There are days that are going to be filled with grunt work in order to achieve what you want to achieve, particularly if you're representing other people, as I do. I can't put my own interests before their interests. Whereas if you're working, you know, in a business um, and you're not working in a representative capacity, although you're working for somebody or a team, um, you have to balance. It seems to me, again, I hate to get involved in cliches, but balance is the key to, uh, to everything. We, you know, it's, um, I, I oftentimes I'll say, uh, I don't want to love everything that I do, but I love what I do, you know? And, and so I think you said, look, I've worked days, but, and, and so that, that, that resonates uh, with me at least in terms of working days where it's like, oh, today wasn't the best day. What was your biggest loss? And I'm going to ask you what your biggest win is like your, your most devastating and it could loss or just that moment where you just like, man, that sucks. Like you're bit, whether it's a case you lost or something that you just were really demoralized to lose. Well, it was the attack on my character yeah. by by that woman and her lawyers uh, who made false accusations from day one. I was able to disprove them. But, you know, we live in a world where you can never disprove an accusation, where uh, I wrote a book called Guilt by Accusation. I don't stand by everything in, in the book. Things have changed, particularly the woman's own admission that she may have misidentified me. But uh, that uh, was probably the most devastating uh, mm. thing that happened to me professionally. And I realized the only woman reason I was accused was because I had defended Jeffrey Epstein. If I hadn't taken that case, uh, the, the accusation never would have occurred. And that took a toll on my family and my children. They were in college at the time. The Me Too movement, you can't disbelieve a woman. Uh, fortunately, it, it it ended well. And, and so, yeah, that, that I mean, that that had to have been tough. It's, uh, it, what do they say? It's the court of public opinion. But I was right. lucky, too. Uh, she picked on the wrong person. I haven't hugged anybody or touched anybody since, you know, well before I met Jeffrey Epstein, I've mm -hmm. been happily married for all these years. I'm not that person. I don't flirt. I don't hug. I never do anything that violates rules. And people knew that about me. So people close to me understood it was impossible. It never happened. People who don't know you just read about it in the newspapers. They say, oh, some, you know, prominent lawyer. Uh, of course he did. Yeah. That, that's the, uh, the well, the, I'm gonna give you a big hug after this episode. Uh -huh. right? No, uh, what about your biggest win? What was that moment where you just like, it just felt like it all came together? Oh, that's easy. Um, and it's probably not somebody that many people have heard of. His name was Anatoly Sharansky. He was a Jewish, a human rights dissident in the Soviet union. And he ended up getting charged with being an American spy and put in jail and threatened with execution. In the Soviet Union? In the Soviet Union. Okay. And his wife and mother called me and asked me to take the case. They had no money. And uh, uh, Forgive me in my ignorance, but so you can be a lawyer in the Soviet Union? If you, if you, if, if you, if you, if you won't take no for an answer, I, I right. put together a team of oh, lawyers yeah. in the Soviet Union, but I took the case along with Erwin Cutler, a dear friend of mine who was then a minister of justice. Did you Canada. travel there? Oh, yeah. No, oh, wow. Numerous times. Oh, hell yeah. And, um, and, and they tried to set me up a few times yeah. uh, in the Soviet Union. But we eventually, after eight years of really hard work, all pro bono, watching him, we, we worked at an exchange of prisoners, watching him walk over the Glynicky Bridge, 
with a smile on his face, a free man. Uh, and his wife had said to me, you have to make me one promise. You'll get him out in time for us to have children. He hadn't had children. And so I, I helped get him out of prison. And she was about 39 years old at the time and had two we, children. Oh, good. That's and that awesome. was, you know, and he whispered in my ear when he, when I first met him, I'd never met him when I was representing him because he was locked up in the gulag. He whispered in my ear uh, just a couple of words in Hebrew, Baruch Matir Asurim, blessed are those who free the imprisoned. It comes from a prayer. And that the tears rolled down yeah, my eyes. I was going to say that. It's the biggest been. fee I ever got in a case, even though I didn't get any fee in the case. It was a different type of fee, right? It right. Was, uh, but we call it sometimes phantom income. It's not a... It's not a traditional form of compensation, but in many ways, it's it's more powerful. And you don't have to pay taxes on it. <laughs> That's right. I'm gonna add that to it. You don't have to pay taxes. Um, what? Uh, so one of the things I mean, you know, I, I read it in your bio. Fifty-two books. Was that just? Did you start at a young age? Like, how do you write that many books? Like, what was the motivation to be behind writing? I know you always loved it, but a kid came to me when I was teaching. He had been top of his class at Harvard Law School. He was going to be a Supreme Court law clerk. And he said to me, Professor Dershowitz, I need your advice. I want to be a professor, but I have no idea about subjects I want to write about. And I said, I have great advice for you. Don't be a professor. Don't be a professor unless you have passion about subjects that you want to teach about and write about. Don't be a teacher or a writer just to write or to teach. So I came to the job with all kinds of passions about civil liberties, human rights, uh, Jewish issues, Israel. So right now I'm on, pay, I'm on f book number 52. I already have 53 in my mind. I already have the outline of 54 in my mind. Can you tell us? Yeah, sure. I'm writing a book called The Preventive State, uh, which deals with how the law is moving away from reacting to preventing, whether it be in medicine or in, in crime. I just... When the Israelis were attacked last Monday, what is it now, uh, two weeks ago, something like that. What's when it, 10-7? 10-7. Seven? Seven. Seven, yeah. I immediately said, I'm writing a book about this. I sat down, I wrote a book about that subject, and I sent it to the publisher yesterday, and it'll be out in two weeks. It's called The War on the Jews, How to Prevent Hamas Barbarity. And so the passion moves me, and I, I write like an automaton. Uh, once I get the passion, once I know what I want to say. So somebody said, how long have you been working on that book about the war on the Jews? I said, there are two answers, one a week and the other 60 years, because yeah. I've been thinking about it for all that time. How do you, you you're writing all these books and you're doing media, yeah. you know, you're still active in law. I say, how do you manage all that time? You know, And I do music every day and yeah. I walk every day. I have a lot, fortunately, thank God, I have a lot of two energy. Grandkids. Huh? Two grandkids. Two grandkids, and um, both in medical, medical. they're both post-medical school, mm -hmm. and three wonderful children. And I spend a lot of time with my family and, 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 and my, my friends. And uh, so I try very hard to live a balanced life. How would, what would you, if you were to summarize and, you know, we talk about motivations and mindsets, is uh, your why? Like, you know, in terms of you looking back at your career, and I know you're still, you're still writing that story, but, you know, you've accomplished so much. Like, what, what was your over, you know, kind of overarching uh, motivation over the years to, to have done everything you've done? Like, what, what was your why? There was no conscious motivation. Um, you know, every phase of my life had, had different motivations. I always wanted to be the best. I always wanted to never be second best. Um, you know, if I had been an athlete, I probably would have tried to do what Brady did, stay on until I was 45, mm -hmm. uh, or Rogers or some of the other great people. Um, I, I just, the idea, I remember talking to Bill Clinton once when he was about to leave office. Um, he had written me a nice note, and we spoke on the phone, and um, and he, he said, I have to get back to work now. And I said, well, it's about 11 o'clock at night. Uh, aren't you going to sleep? He said, I'll have plenty of time to sleep after I'm president. And, uh, you know, I'll have plenty of time to sleep when I'm dead. And so I want to make the most of every moment that I have. Uh, that's what my wife notices about me. I don't waste a minute. Uh, I, I can spend a lot of time, you know, walking and just 
listening to music, but I never just sit there. I never just waste. Not a lot of idle time. hands. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think they call it the Devil's Workshop. Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, two U.S. presidents. Uh, oftentimes, I ask the question: What have you seen to be a common characteristic or trait of of the the driven high achievers that you've known in your life? Let's just focus on two guys who've achieved the highest office in the land, the United States presidency, whether it's, uh, you know, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, or, a- or anybody you've known who has truly, truly achieved, you know, the height of heights or the top of their profession. What, what, do you, what would you say is, is a common mentality people like that share? I think they all believe they're irreplaceable. Um, the same thing is true of my other very close friend, Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister yeah. of Israel I've known since he was in his 20s. They think that without them, the country will not survive. They think they're indispensable. Of course, it was de Gaulle who said graveyards are filled with indispensable and irreplaceable people. But I think that's what has to motivate you. Mm -hmm. When I take a case, I say to myself, I think I'm the only lawyer who can win this case. Um, I, you know, have the combination of factors, uh, experience, uh, you know, background, knowledge, hard work. I can win this case. I'm not sure there's another lawyer who can. So there's that concept of indispensability, which is very arrogant and almost I was going to, yeah, yeah, it's funny. I've never heard this answer. It's it's fascinating. I was going to call it a healthy ego or in the case of Bill Clinton or Donald Trump, I don't know if people would describe it as a healthy ego, but ego is this feeling of like, I'm the only one who can do this. Yeah. And it begins to merge with narcissism sometimes. And so a little bit of both of those, are, are really important. Because if you think somebody can do the job better than you, you're not going to no. do it. You're not doing it well, for the money at this point. You're certainly not going to subject yourself. Uh, you know, obviously you've gone through some things with some mm-hmm. of the cases you talked oh, about, yeah. but imagine Bill Clinton and Donald Trump. Again, I'm not commenting on whether they brought it on themselves. I'm just saying like what they and their families they have had They did to... bring it on themselves. <laughs> Let's be very clear. Look, Bill Clinton's having an affair with a uh, you know, a early 20s woman while he was being one of the great presidents and ruining his legacy, legacy. and hurting our country. There's no excuse for that. And Donald Trump saying some of the dumb things that he said, these are self-inflicted. I hope I haven't had any self-inflicted uh, wounds yeah, no, in my life, but point. who knows, maybe I have. Yeah, or tweeting, right? Um, tweeting things. Uh, but yeah, it's this belief that... Uh, I'm the only one who can do this. I mean, they had to have known what they were going to subject, not just themselves, but their families through in terms of just the, you know, running for election, let alone when you're in the office. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it, so you, that, that's it. I've never heard that answer is like, it's um, the belief that uh, with those that you've seen achieve the highest, highest of highs, it's, there's almost like they all share individually this belief that they're the only ones who can do it. I think that's right. I, I've seen that not only among the, the two presidents that I've represented, but other people who've been in very, very, very high positions uh, of authority. They, they look in the mirror and they say, if it's not me, it won't happen. No, I'm going to ask that question the opposite. I'm sure you've... But don't you think that about yourself in some ways, at least unconsciously? You've done a great job building and running a great company. When you look at yourself in the morning when you're shaving, don't you say, you know... It's me, and if, if I don't do this, it's not going to happen. Absolutely. Okay. Now, I'm going to add to that. I look at myself and say, I'm the only one, but I add on what I call my teammates here, my, my, my leadership team, my, my executive team, and really all of my teammates. Uh, I, I really look at it as like, we are the only ones who can do this. I, I'm going to lead it. I'll make a lot of the decisions, but there is a we in a company that might be slightly different than a politician, right? Oh, it is. And, you know, politicians need teams too. Yeah. And I used to work with teams. I don't work with teams anymore. Mm-hmm. I, I am really alone. I do it on my own. I can bring people on board to do a particular task, but um, I do do it myself. And so I, I do say to myself, uh, and people ask me all the time, you know, you're a strong defender of Israel. You make the case for Israel very powerfully. What's going to happen when you're gone? And it makes me think, have I picked a successor? Have I worked with younger people? Maybe I haven't done a good enough job in making sure there's continuity because 
everything is a team. Uh, no matter how uh, egotistical you are, uh, nobody can do it all alone. I agree. I, I, I will, but I want to get back to the question and ask it in reverse. I'm sure throughout your career, you've, you've also ran into many people who, who didn't necessarily get to where they thought they wanted to go in life. What would you say was the biggest uh, characteristic or trait? What was the biggest reason that you would meet people and they'd say, well, I, I wanted to achieve this or I want to go do that, but they, they never got there. What was their biggest? Oh, that's very simple. Yeah. If you have one specific goal, just one specific goal instead of multiple goals, uh, it's very, very likely you won't achieve your one goal. I have a friend who had one goal. He wanted to be a justice of the Supreme Court, and he never made it. And he never made it because the statistical likelihood of being a Supreme Court justice, no matter how brilliant you are, is about the same as winning the lottery. There are so many factors. You know, will a vacancy occur? Did it occur at a time when uh, somebody of a different gender had to be picked? It's not about you. It's about a, a process. But this person has become very disappointed and mm -hmm. very disillusioned and very unhappy uh, because he didn't achieve that one goal. I never had that one goal. I wanted to do a lot, a lot of different things. And um, I've accomplished many of them, but not all of them. And, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, I'm still young, so I'm going to try to accomplish the few things that I haven't accomplished. What, what are the few things you haven't accomplished that you're, well, that you're pursuing right now? I would say right I've written a lot of really, really good books that have had a very positive influence on, 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 on life. Uh, but I haven't yet written the perfect book that I somehow contemplated that I would write. And maybe I still will. I'm working on it now. Uh, the book, The Preventive State, that I'm working mm -hmm. on kind of summarizes a lot of the work I've done over time. But I would say I accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish as a teacher. I've accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish as a litigator. Uh, and um, as a writer, I've come close. I'm going to tie. I'm going to kind of wrap this up here. Is it, what advice would you have for listeners, you know, either personally, professionally, to achieve what they want in life, whatever it is they think that they want? You know, it's um, again, yeah. uh, very simple. Do not have a single goal. You won't get it. Don't try to win the New York lottery. It won't happen. Um, have multiple goals. Have a range of possible outcomes. Be flexible. Go with the flow. Go with the times. Live the passion of your times. But don't don't have a specific one goal because that's almost impossible to accomplish. Professionally speaking, don't put all your eggs in one basket, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And uh, in a practical sense, is there a, a, a resource, a book, a, a something that you would recommend, something very specific where you're like, oh, this, you know, this helped me a lot or... Well, this is going to sound strange. No. Um, so one of the books I'm about to write is Why I Pray Like an Orthodox Jew, Think Like an Agnostic, and Act Like an Atheist. Um, you know, I don't, my life, I don't make decisions based on, on God. I don't know whether God exists or not. I'm agnostic about everything in life. How could I ever believe he doesn't exist or does exist? But I love the Jewish tradition, so I, I pray like an, Orthodox, uh, uh, like an Orthodox Jew. So this will sound surprising to you. The book that has been most influential in my life has been the Bible um, for somebody who's a secular person. And the reason I love the Jewish Bible, I love things about the New Testament, things about the Quran too. The uniqueness of the Jewish Bible is there are no good characters in it. Everybody is deeply flawed. Abraham tries to kill his son. Moses, you know, does all these terrible. David, David has yeah. sex with, you know, this this married woman, and 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 the Bible teaches about struggle, the attempt to do justice. So actually, my favorite of my imperfect books is called the Genesis of Justice. It's a book about what I've learned from struggling with the Bible, and so the Bible has had a big, big influence on my life. Even though I got C's and D's in elementary school from my rabbis because I didn't give them the right interpretation mm -hmm. of the Bible. And I've been trying to do my own interpretation now for the last 75 did, did years. Did any of those rabbis ever at some point later on, you know, reach out or you ran into them? In, in the, my in, mother ran into Rabbi Zuroff. Uh, he was the guy who said you should do something that you need to loud mouth, mouth and but no not brain, your yeah. brain. 
my mother ran into Rabbi Zurich when they were both very, very old. And my mother said, see, now do you admit you were wrong? And Rabbi Zurich turned to my mother and said, is your son orthodox? And my mother says, no, I wasn't wrong, he said. <laughs> he was a failure. He would be a success if you were orthodox. But yeah. if he's not orthodox, he's a failure. This is after I was, you know, I was going to say, the well, top you get, of my you know, profession. I guess you got to, you got to. Handed to the guy. So for the I didn't commitment. show him. I didn't. I never. I never achieved my goal of making the rabbis understand they were wrong. He still thought I was. He was right. Last question. What What do you want your legacy to be like? What do you want when people say, "Oh, you know, Alan Dershowitz"? What What, what do you hope they say when describing you? He put principle over popularity. Uh, he always did things based on principle. He never deviated from his principles. And, uh, um, and, and as a result, was not always as popular as he, he could have been. So for me, I've tried very hard to live a life that's, of principle. That's the title of a great book, Principle mm -hmm. Over Popularity. Mm -hmm. Okay. My next uh, you number, said six, you've, you number said 56. You said okay. you've written a lot of good ones. That uh, I don't that know. That sounds one. great to yeah. me, Principle Over Popularity, because it, it, it's not just a book about what you've done, you know, which is choose principle over popularity. It's also, uh, I think, that choice. Mm hmm Everybody's faced multiple times in their life in very big moments. Principle. So I popular. did write a book called "The Price of Principle: Why Integrity mm -hmm. Is Worth the Consequences," but it doesn't quite deal with that. But uh, you know, principle is very, very important to me. A single standard, justice. These are all things that have motivated me throughout my life. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here. This has been great. Uh, hey, your I'm, questions I'm, are phenomenal. You you really had to ask a question. You would have been a great cross-examining lawyer. Yeah, you know, it's uh, <laughs> that's what my dad says. Uh, that's funny you say that. Uh, no, nah, you know, you, you sit in this chair. Well, the you difference get, between being a defense lawyer and a defensive back in football, it's only a matter of degree. You're yeah, and, trying uh, to and, prevent and, the other and, team and, from scoring. And some, <laughs> and some physical violence, right? But uh, no, you know, you sit in this chair, you just get better at it. And it, I have the easiest job in the world. You know, I just get to ask, open it. It's like sales, you know, sales out in the real estate field. You, they teach you early on. It took me a long time to pick it up, but it's, you got to ask open-ended questions. And the biggest thing that I had to learn was shut up and listen. Well, it's know? interesting because people teach law students all the time. Don't ask open-ended questions. Always know the answer. I have one rule. Never say never or always if you're trying to teach because mm -hmm. everything is different. There is a time for an open-ended question. There's a time for asking a question that you don't know the answer to. And the mediocre lawyer always just follows the rule book. And the really good lawyer understands when you follow those traditions and when you take risks. Taking risks is an essential part of success. Well, I appreciate you, you coming on and being on the show. And I'm happy to hear your your time in Nashville is going well. And, and oh, you hopefully have a Looking great have this gorgeous fall weather. Yeah, Enjoy yeah, it. And yeah. uh you know, enjoy some, uh, some of the music and, uh, you know, I'll be in, uh, I'm sure I'll be in New York soon. I'll, I'll reach out, but please, uh, I'd love, it's uh, great to have you. I can't thank you enough. Thank, thank you, you so much. See you.